Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode one of three in our new series on hunger. Today we're gonna ask ourselves what happens when we eat. Tomorrow we're gonna talk about what happens when we don't eat. And then later on we're gonna talk about, do we even need to do this? Can't we just stop eating? I mean, food is really important. It's something we do every day, so we really wanted to look into this. Welcome, if it's your first episode of D News Plus, this is a show where we take a big topic and we break it down so everybody understands it a bit better. That's not unlike what our stomach does with food breaking it down. Anyway, we're gonna get into it, so make sure you stick around for that. If you don't subscribe here on YouTube, that's an easy click away right down there. You can also come find us over on iTunes, though, if you wanna listen to this whole series all at once. Easy to find, also down in the description. Make sure you subscribe, please, and also share this show with your friends if you like it. So, again, I'm Trace, let's kick into it. So, first we need to go through what happens when we eat food, which is funny because when I was in biology in middle school, we had to do an oral exam where we walked through the process of what happens when you eat a carbohydrate or a protein or a sugar or water, and you drew a card, and then you got to pick one of those things and walk all the way through it with Dr. Shooks, my biology teacher. Now, it was really awesome to get water because that one's really easy, but you're gonna understand all of this a little bit better in a minute. So, every day we eat food. I mean, most of us. Most of us eat food every day. But why? We eat food so we can stay alive, right? Simple answer. It's a little more complicated than that if you dig into it. Basically, food is the building blocks of life. It is the nutrients that keeps our body running and helps us grow, and we literally use the components of food to build out our bodies. We're constantly making new cells and excreting fluids all throughout our bodies, and all of that stuff that we do, every hormone, every chemical, doesn't just come out of the ether. It's made from the stuff that we put into our body through our mouth. Now, our body does things that make us want to eat. We evolved to eat. It's something that we do. And when we haven't eaten in a bit, hormones are released that tell our brain that we need to eat. Then once we do eat, it reduces those hormones, it ups other hormones, and that's how we know we're not hungry anymore. Again, it gets way more complicated than this. So first we should talk about the hormone ghrelin. And once our bodies have used up all the food that we've consumed, or enough of it that we're starting to think about hunger again out here, what's happening inside is that the hormone ghrelin is being excreted. It tells the hypothalamus, where things like sleep, mood, sex drive, and hunger are regulated, that our blood sugar is dropping and we need to eat. So the brain releases neuropeptide Y, the primary hunger signal, and now you are hungry. But being hungry doesn't really tell you what to eat, right? You have to crave something. I mean, you don't always have to. Sometimes you just want to shove food in your face, especially when you're real busy at work, right? But chances are you are craving something pretty much every day. Now, cravings have something to do with how our bodies evolved. We crave sugars because we need those to survive. We crave fats and salts because those are also rare things in nature. We like those things because when we can get them, they're good for us. Now, today, we have them everywhere, so that craving can hurt us. But back in the day, you ate what you could find, what you could hunt for and forage. You didn't have room to be picky. You just needed to eat to survive. So that's where those drives come from. Today, preferences actually start, they think, in the uterus. In the second trimester, the sense of taste and smell develop, and babies are born with a preference to sweetness. A mother's diet can also affect the milk that she then passes on to her baby. So studies show a mother's diet can predict her child's food preferences. A study found that women who drank carrot juice while feeding had children who were more likely to eat carrots than women who didn't drink carrot juice. But there aren't tons of studies on this because there are so many variables to consider, so obviously, on my favorite phrase, more research is needed. But another reason that we want to eat something specific also comes from childhood, and that is memory. We crave foods that we've had before. Our brain is telling us we enjoyed it once, we can have this again, right? This could come from repeated experiences, you know, the more you eat something, the more you're gonna like it for the most part. But it also could come from memories of textures or smells or something that makes you happy, birthday cake, french fries with your, your dad or your mom or something. We also have aversions to certain flavors coded into our development, like how babies love sweets, they don't like bitterness. Some people eventually develop a taste for bitter foods, but others don't. It kind of comes with the territory. The reason is sweetness indicates sugars. Sugars are something we need. Bitterness indicates foods that might be off or not as good for you, according to research that scientists have done. So it, that might be why we don't like it. However, you can learn to like it. 
Where you put the food that you want to eat is also very important and what happens in there. So once you've decided you're hungry and you've decided that you crave something specific like an apple, you have to take that apple and you have to put it somewhere. Fun fact, chewing your food is important. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but it's super important. You have to chew your food so that it can be mixed in with saliva. Saliva, by the way, Fun fact that I discovered recently when I did some genetic testing, you have to fill up a vial with some of your saliva. Saliva is not always clear. We think of it as a clear liquid, but it's actually opaque. It's produced by salivary glands and it's made up of water and mucus and electrolytes and enzymes. And it's the beginning of the digestive process. This is the top of your digestive tract. So saliva starts that digestive process, but it also lubricates your food and makes it easier for you to swallow. An enzyme called amylase helps break down starches into maltose or malt sugar, and that way it's absorbed easier into the small intestine. It also turns things into glucose, which helps fuel your body. Saliva also keeps your mouth healthy. It has antibacterial properties and helps clean things. It actually, it does a lot of stuff. It's really, really cool. But we're mostly talking about eating. Dental hygiene can be a whole other episode. Additionally, saliva Saliva triggers more digestion processes going on later in the GI tract. Basically, it tells your stomach, hey, hey, food's on its way, get ready. So if we follow that bite of that apple, you get saliva-soaked food going down your esophagus, which is about eight inches or 20 centimeters. And once it enters the esophagus, the parasympathetic nervous system starts to move the muscles in your esophagus to push it down there. At the top and the bottom of the esophagus are sphincters. You have a few of those in your body. And that relaxes to let food through, obviously, and then out of the esophagus into the stomach. And that's basically it. You've now started eating. I mean, technically you started when you put the food in your mouth, but once it gets into your body a little bit more, that's when it really becomes useful. Once you're in the stomach, this is where food gets mixed with digestive liquids. It, the stomach looks kind of like a big comma, right? <laughs> food gets churned up and broken down by the gastric juices and enzymes inside your stomach. Again, these are muscle contractions that you're not consciously controlling, right? But there are muscles in there moving stuff around. The main enzyme inside of your stomach acting on your food is pepsin. You make three to four liters of gastric juices every day. And just like saliva breaks down starch, the gastric juices break down your proteins. Hydrochloric acid is secreted in your stomach as well. That helps kill bacteria and further digest your food. It also secretes a mucus inside of the stomach that clings to the walls of it so that that acid and all those enzymes that are working on the food don't also work on your stomach. It's very smart. Good job, body. Muscles work to turn all of this stuff into a nice thick cream, and I hope you're not eating right now because this is the grossest part. Uh, it's really nasty, but anyway, once it's in this thick cream, it's then squirted into the small intestine out of the bottom of the stomach through one of my favorite words in the digestive tract, the duodenum. Duodenum. It's just a great word. So once it's done breaking it down, that's called chyme. Another great word. Ugh, gross. So now that thick chyme is squirted out into your lower intestinal tract and it breaks down that food a little bit more. The small intestines are 20 feet long and that's where your body absorbs most of the nutrients in there that's all broken down. First, food goes into that small intestine and food from the stomach mixes with enzymes from the pancreas, bile from the gallbladder, and that breaks down food even more. Then the jejunum, which is where the walls of the intestine absorb nutrients into the bloodstream, and that looks like kind of an accordion, pretty much. Folds inside of that small intestine help make the surface area greater. Same with cilia, it makes absorption even easier. And that's where it gets into the blood where it can actually be put to use. It can be absorbed into capillary walls and into cells, things like amino acids and vitamins and sugars and salts and things that we can use to build our body. That's the process all the way to the cell. So, that's assuming, of course, you're eating healthy foods. Otherwise, you're probably gonna have a lot of sugars and a lot of salts. It's finally going to good use. Then you get to the ileum. That's where bile acids are absorbed and sent into the liver to make more bile and put back into the gallbladder. And that's where vitamin B12 is made. So all this stuff is what happens to that little bit of apple as it goes into your body. And now you come to the fun part. We've done all the small intestine. We've gone through all 20 feet and we're heading into the large intestine. This is basically what happens 
after all of the nutrients have been absorbed, and what's left behind is a mixture of other things like fiber and water. So large intestine is supposed to absorb those things. And then it just kind of hangs out. Wait till next time you excuse yourself to go to the bathroom and see a man about a horse. It absorbs any remaining nutrients and changes that at liquid waste into solid stool. It moves about a centimeter per hour. Then you open up another sphincter and out it goes. Hopefully into a toilet. The feeling of uh, being full comes along in this process. If you eat a whole apple, maybe you're not hungry anymore. It's called uh, being satiated, and your body makes another chemical to tell all these processes, hey, hey, we're good, we're good. This is referred to as CKK or cholecystokinin, and this is made when food hits the first part of those small intestines to help relay the message, hey, it's gotten to the part, we're gonna absorb some stuff, go back to the brain and tell them we're good. And that's how eating works. That's why you're hungry. That's what happens when you eat. Something a lot of people don't think about, but if you really like sit down and you know stare up at the stars for a minute and think about your body, we're sort of just like a tube. There's a big tube, it's weird. Anyway, we don't have time to go into all of the different hormones and all of the different enzymes that are acting on the food throughout this process. Sorry, Dr. Shooks. But we thought you would enjoy taking that journey through the human body, especially, you know, thinking about how that apple becomes poop. That's pretty fun. So now you know what happens when you eat something, but what happens when you don't eat something? You know, if your body starts telling you, hey, can you eat? And you're like, nah, bro, I can't. What happens? You're gonna find out more about that tomorrow. So make sure you subscribe so you get all the D News Plus that you can, and make sure that you tell us down in the comments if you have a favorite story about eating food, because I do. I definitely uh, had carrots come out of my nose when I was a kid all over somebody. It was awesome. It was not actually that awesome. I sneezed. Came out my nose. Anyway. Let us know your story down in the comments. Make sure you come find us over on Twitter. You can find the show at DNews. You can tweet any questions you may have or ideas for the future episodes at DNews with the hashtag DNews Plus or at me at Trace Dominguez. I said add a lot. Now I'm hungry. Thanks for tuning in.